26. Okay. Well, good morning. I'd like to welcome you to the fifth Scarlet Scholar Series Lecture featuring Dr. Margaret Marsh, University Professor of History, Chancellor Emerita, Dean Emerita, and a graduate of Rutgers Camden. My name is Bob Atkins, and I have the pleasure and privilege of serving as the Interim Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences here in Camden. Together with the Office of Alumni Engagement and Annual Giving, it's our pleasure to present this series, which gives a platform to our faculty to share their research with a wide audience. We are extremely excited for today's lecture and have planned for more events later this year. Today's lecturer is Dr. Margaret Marsh, who is a newly named as a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Dr. Marsh holds the title of a university professor at Rutgers, dividing her time between Rutgers Camden and the Institute for Health in New Brunswick. For 11 years, she served as Dean and later Executive Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences and the Graduate School at Camden. She also served twice in the role of chancellor, the first time for more than two years from 2007 through 2009, and the second from July of 2020 through June of 2021. And I just wanna pause here to say that I would not be sitting here in this chair right now if not for Margaret and all the great work she's done to support me and my work. So I'm so appreciative of her. Back to Margaret though. Before she came to Rutgers, Mar Marsh was a professor and department chair at Temple University, where she developed the PhD program in women's and gender history. From 1975 until 1991, she was a professor and Dean of Arts and Humanities at Stockton University. Dr. Marsh is the author of numerous articles and five books, three of them co-authored with her sister, Wanda Rahner, who is a professor of clinical obstetrics and gynecology at the Perlman School of Medicine of the University of Pennsylvania. Their most recent book, The Pursuit of Parenthood, Reproductive Technology from Test Tube Babies to Uterus Transplants, was funded by a major grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and was a finalist for the 2020 Prose Award in the history of science, medicine, and technology. This morning, Dr. Marsh will present From Test Two Babies to Uterus Transplant, Assisted Reproduction and the Pursuit of Parenthood, which is drawn from her latest book. Dr. Marsh will examine the history of the unprecedented ways by which families can now be created, beginning with the efforts to create embryos outside a woman's body and ending with such, such new developments as mitochondrial replacement techniques, so-called three parent embryos and uterus transplants. This talk will explore these new technologies and their impact. At the conclusion of Dr. Marsh's presentation, we will open the chat for a moderated question and answer period. Again, thank you so much for being with us today. Please join me in warm, warmly welcoming Dr. Marsh. Margaret. Thanks, um, thanks, Bob, and thanks to everybody who's come to hear my talk. I'm, I'm really appreciative. Uh, and before we get started, I want to acknowledge my longtime collaborator, Wanda Rahner. She is my sister. She's a professor of obstetrics and gynecology at, uh, at Penn, and she's a practicing gynecologist. And we've been working together for about um, three decades uh, on the history of reproductive medicine, reproductive sexuality, and reproductive technology. So um, my work today is informed by her work as well as mine on the book. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, assisted reproductive technology today, and I want to start with a definition of it, because some people think Assisted reproductive technology refers to all infertility treatment. And some people think it refers to all reproductive technology. It doesn't. It, it's a medical term that refers to those reproductive technologies that involve handling eggs or embryos outside the body. The most common form of assisted reproductive technology is in vitro fertilization, which is abbreviated IVF. 
this is how it works. This diagram shows it, and I hope the diagram is sufficiently explanatory. So Wanda's in my new book is a comprehensive history of assisted reproduction. So please consider this talk just a brief introduction to the subject. I'm going to focus first on the emergence of these technologies and second on their expansion and growth in the United States from the early days until now. So as I've been talking these last couple of minutes, um, probably the latest baby was born using IVF. At least 8 million babies have been born around the world as a result of IVF, and more than a million of them have been born in the United States. Could be as many as 9 million, not every country. Keeps good records, but it's at least 8 million. The first one was born in 1978, and we are going to begin with this first baby. It's a dramatic story. The date is July the 25th. It's almost midnight in a small hospital just outside the city of Manchester, England, everything is quiet. Well, everything is quiet except in one of the operating rooms where a 30-year-old woman is about to give birth to her first child. Her name was Leslie Brown. She was a homemaker from Bristol and her husband, John, was a truck driver. Mrs. Brown was about ready to have a routine cesarean section. She was being prepped. Routine, that is, except for the hour, secrecy, security detail, and the film crew. So why did they need a film crew? Well, the film crew was on hand to document the entrance into the world of the first baby ever born who was conceived using in vitro fertilization. Gynecologist Patrick Steptoe was performing the C-section. Biologist Robert Edwards, who had been working towards this moment for at least a decade and a half, was there to witness the birth. So was Jean Purdy, she's in the middle in this picture, a nurse, an embryologist, and she was Edwards' research assistant. Together, these three people had made Mrs. Brown's pregnancy possible. Stepto delivered the baby, and then he repaired Mrs. Brown's uterus. And after he did that, he lifted the uterus out of her abdomen so it could be filmed. Why did he do this? He needed to make it clear to the world that Mrs. Brown had no fallopian tubes. Having no fallopian tubes would prove that she could not have gotten pregnant any other way except with IVF. In normal conception, the fallopian tubes is where the egg meets the sperm and fertilization occurs. If you don't have at least one working fallopian tube, then normal conception can't happen. Stepto needed to show conclusively that baby Louise really was an IVF baby. It's impossible to overstate the sensation this birth caused. Louise's parents had been stalked relentlessly by the press during Les's pregnancy. And the attention was even more frenzied after Louise's birth. Some of the attention depressed and angered the family. Louise was called a Franken baby and worse. People expressed surprise that she looked just like a regular baby. It's hard to imagine that now, but so new was this technology that nobody knew in the public's eye what to expect. IVF was developed to overcome the cause of infertility that affected Leslie Brown. Doctors call that tubal factor infertility. And tubal disease can be caused by a lot of things, infections, complications from abdominal surgery, endometriosis. And Robert Edwards was not the first researcher to believe that IVF could be a solution to this problem. 
just about 40 years before Louise Brown was conceived, Harvard physician John Rock wrote about IVF's potential in an editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine. He'd been following the work of a biologist who had achieved birth after IVF in a rabbit. And John Rock thought, well, if this can be done in rabbits, why not in women? And in his flowery way of communicating, he said, well, if this works, what a boon for the barren woman with closed tubes. Well, seven years later, Rock and his assistant, Miriam Mencken, were the first ever to report success in fertilizing human eggs in vitro. Unfortunately, after that success in 1944, their research stalled. Rock and Mencken made no progress, and research really didn't pick up again until Robert Edwards made it a priority. Edwards partnered with Patrick Steptoe in 1968, and they immediately started to have rapid success in fertilization. Soon other scientists were taking note and a team of Australian biologists and physicians in Melbourne were inspired by Edwards and also began experiments. Both groups were achieving pregnancies by the middle of the 1970s. American researchers were out of the picture. They were inhibited by a ban on federal funding of IVF research, and they did not follow the lead of the English and the Australians. And of course, with Louise Brown, the English were the first to succeed. The success of this tiny team of researchers was indeed a monumental accomplishment. And it eventually resulted in a Nobel Prize in 2010 for Robert Edwards. He got the Nobel Prize because he was the only one of the three still alive. It took the Australians two more years, but in 1980, that nation had its first IVF baby. By early 1982, 15 so-called test tube babies, but you know they weren't conceived in test tubes because you saw the jar in which Louise Brown's embryo was cultured. So you know it wasn't really a test tube, but they still called them test tube babies. By early 1982, 15 test tube babies had been born. And most of them in Australia, once the Australians got going, there was no stopping them. Only one of these babies had been born in the US to Judith and Roger Carr. Judith was 28 when she gave birth in December of 1981. Her baby, Elizabeth Jordan Carr, had been conceived in the first IVF clinic in the US. That clinic opened in Norfolk, Virginia in 1980. The clinic was founded by two distinguished physicians. Georgiana Jones was a prominent reproductive endocrinologist, and her husband, Howard Jones, was a gynecologic surgeon. In 1978, they had been forced into mandatory retirement from Johns Hopkins Medical School. They were research powerhouses, and they were immediately recruited by a brand new medical school in Norfolk. And to get them to come, Eastern Virginia Medical School promised that they could pursue any research they chose and they would have the school's full support. They probably did not expect them to choose IVF, uh, but they did. And in the US, IVF was very controversial. The medical school still kept its word. Lawsuits were filed against the new program legislation was proposed to stop it, and every effort failed. The clinic opened as planned, and the Joneses, who were now almost 70 years old, embarked on a brand new career. Soon, they had a waiting list of patients numbering 
in the thousands. The Joneses' success emboldened many of their colleagues around the country. Within just a couple of months of baby Elizabeth's birth, IVF clinics opened up at several leading academic medical centers, including Penn right across the river. And within just six years, the US had close to 200 IVF programs, treating almost 10,000 patients. All of them were paying for these expensive procedures with their own money. It was experimental and insurance didn't cover it. Couples sometimes sold their houses or took out second mortgages to pay for it. Success was hit or miss. In fact, there was a national take-home baby rate of just about 9%. But determined potential parents were not discouraged. In the 1980s, the typical IVF patients were married heterosexual couples in which the wife was in her 20s or her early 30s. They were using their own sperm and their own eggs. In some ways, that's not so different from today. Today, the typical IVF patients are married or partnered heterosexual couples using their own sperm and eggs. But they are older with the wife most often in her 30s sometimes even in her early 40s. But these typical patients are no longer the only patients. And today there is a range of new technologies to make parenthood possible. When IVF was first developed in the US, it wasn't clear even how acceptable it would be. Opposition came from several directions, from anti-abortion activists on the right to some radical feminist on the left. The times were such that political divisions made it impossible to achieve political consensus. And in the larger society, the 1980s were characterized by a resurgence of conservative attitudes about women's appropriate roles, and assisted reproductive technologies began to be integrated into a larger controversy over women's educational and career ambitions. In some ways, this is an old story. In the 1880s, women who attended college were told that they were educating themselves into sterility, which was the early term for infertility. In the 1980s, this old idea got a new twist. Explosive reporting in the media fed into that narrative. In 1984, Time Magazine had a cover story on the new reproductive technologies. It opened with a declaration from one IVF expert that the United States was in the grip of an infertility epidemic, that's the word he used. And then in the article, other experts chimed in saying that infertility was especially prevalent among educated women, particularly, this is the term they used, women executives, those dreaded women executives. Well, neither claim was true. Infertility rates were declining, not rising in the 1980s, and they had been declining since the 1960s. And as for educated, middle-class, and well-to-do women, they actually had lower infertility rates, not higher ones than women without educational and economic advantages. In fact, this is still true today. But that was not what the public heard or read. In the broad media narrative, infertility was a problem for women with college degrees, and professional ambitions. And in the media, nearly all of these women were white. So just in case the idea of an infertility epidemic wasn't scary enough, 
1986, there was this issue of Newsweek shown on the right in this slide. Now, the author of this story claimed that data showed that young women who persisted in seeking professional careers would never find a husband. They went on to declare in one memorable phrase that a single woman of 40 was more likely to be killed by a terrorist. That's what they said than to marry. This article was also based on false data. So false, in fact, that Newsweek, some 20 years later, some 10 years later, sorry, some, no, 20 years later, some 20 years later actually retracted it. But in the 1980s, such stories had real impact. So just think of what this narrative told career-minded young women. If you focus on your professional life, you will be doomed to a lonely and sterile middle age. Stories like this fed into a rising backlash against feminism and women's rights that were part of the conservative tide sweeping through American politics in the 1980s. And by the end of the decade, surveys showed that men across the political and cultural spectrum had become less likely to support gender equality at work and in public life. And these men also said that they really preferred a traditional marriage in which the husband worked outside the home and the wife took care of the family. There was some pushback against the backlash, um, including several efforts to pass federal legislation supporting families and women in the workforce, but these efforts largely failed. And it became up to individual couples to navigate these two worlds. In fact, it still is. Assisted reproductive technology has helped make that navigation possible, providing new role, new possibilities for parenthood. Today, there are about 500 fertility centers across the US providing assisted reproductive technologies. The average age of an IVF patient now is 36, not in her 20s, and about 20% 20 of the women seeking treatment are older than 40. This is probably inevitable given that most women work outside the home and they continue to bear the brunt of society's domestic expectations. People are marrying later and they are postponing having children. And delayed parent, delaying parenthood can bring real uncertainties, including declining fertility. But infertility treatment can often help if pregnancy doesn't happen as quickly as expected. And if medical treatments for infertility fail, assisted reproductive technology can often succeed, at least through a woman's 30s and sometimes through the early 40s. In fact, about 10% of women between 40 and 45 having IVF can get pregnant using their own eggs. Some women though face additional challenges. As a category, black women face higher complications from infertility compared to women in other racial categories. And many black women say they feel dismissed when they seek treatment. And women with low incomes across racial and ethnic categories also face higher infertility rates, as well as difficulties in access to care. But assisted reproductive technology does more than help women and couples delaying childbearing until their 30s or early 40s. In addition to rising numbers of heterosexual couples in these years seeking IVF, there have been other important trends in the use of assisted reproduction in the past few decades. As ideas about the nature of family have changed, the categories of patients using assisted reproductive technologies have expanded. Here are some examples. Severe male infertility was once nearly an intractable problem 
And it can now be addressed with a technique called intracytoplasmic sperm injection, abbreviated ICSI. Now, ICSI requires IVF. So although it's the man who has the infertility problem, it's the woman who undergoes treatment. Another expanded use of IVF is in women in their 50s and even in their 60s. These women will need donor eggs to conceive unless they happen to have frozen embryos left over from their fertile years or much less likely for women in these, in these ages to have a frozen egg. In addition, access to assisted reproduction for gay, lesbian, and transgender individuals and couples has been expanding since the 1990s. For male couples, the use of gestational surrogacy allows them to experience genetic parenthood. Gestational surrogacy was first used for women unable to carry a pregnancy for medical reasons in the 1980s, and its use was very rare. In 1985, just one IVF program offered services to gestational carriers. Today, nearly 90% of them do. Now, gestational surrogacy does remain among the lesser used reproductive options. Recent data shows that just about 5% of egg retrieval cycles are for gestational surrogates. And that percentage includes both heterosexual and same-sex couples. But this is still up from about a decade or so ago when it was just 1% of retrieval cycles. What I can't tell though, I have to tell you what I can't tell about this is whether the percentages are up because more American residents are using gestational surrogates or whether it's from an increased number of international patients. Um, most European countries prohibit gestational surrogacy altogether. And in Great Britain, you can only use altruistic surrogacy. So it used to be that India and Thailand were the hubs of international surrogacy, but they have cracked down in recent years on the practice. So there are some other options, but well-to-do international patients are increasingly coming to the United States for gestational surrogacy, and they may be contributing to the enhanced uh, numbers, but it's still only 5% of retrieval cycles. The expansion of assisted Production also includes services for individuals and couples who are not infertile, but are carriers of severe genetic disease, or couples who are at risk of giving birth to a child with chromosome abnormalities. This slide describes pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, known as PGD, and pre-implantation genetic screening, known as PGS. PGD is used for couples in which one or both is a carrier of a single gene defect. Uh, cystic fibrosis is one example of this kind of disease. These patients can have IVF, and then their embryos undergo PGD. Only embryos without the genetic defect are transferred. PGS does not diagnose a specific disease. It looks for chromosome abnormalities. It can also tell the sex of an embryo. It's very controversial over using PGS if you just wanna have a male child or a female child, but it is done. Another way in which assisted reproductive technology has expanded involves something called egg freezing. Egg freezing for the preservation of future fertility. In the early 21st century, not that long ago, uh, effective egg freezing techniques were developed. And the initial idea behind this was that you would use these techniques to help 
young women with cancer. They were about to have treatments, most often chemotherapy, that would save their lives, but might make them infertile. And the idea behind this was that you could freeze their eggs to give them a chance of a future pregnancy. And back then, first decade of the 21st century, the numbers of women taking advantage of egg freezing was pretty low, a few hundred a year. But it didn't take too long before egg freezing attracted the attention of women delaying pregnancy for non-medical reasons. You can look at the middle panel of, of this slide. They were freezing their eggs in hopes of preserving their fertility until they were ready to bear a child. And, and in fact, by 2018, there was some data to indicate that as many as 13,000 women froze their eggs. But as you can see from this slide, there are no guarantees here. Um, it may, the eggs may stay frozen, they may stay frozen and provide a pregnancy, but there is absolutely no guarantee that they will do so. The chances of a baby in the future uh, are not as high as some of these centers may lead you to believe they are. Next, there are two recent developments in assisted reproduction. One is uterus transplants and the other is mitochondrial replacement therapies. The first uterus transplants is now in clinical trials. And the second is thus far banned in the United States. Uterus transplants are for fertile women who don't have a uterus. And in the United States, there are now four academic medical centers doing clinical trials. One of them is the University of Pennsylvania and 14 births have occurred in this country so far. Mitochondrial replacement therapies called MRT would allow women who are carriers of mitochondrial disease to be able to have children without such disease. They are controversial because they create what some call three parent embryos in girls, but not in boys. The donor mitochondrial DNA could be passed down to the next generation. In 2016, the National Academy of Medicine recommended that the FDA approve the limited use of these techniques under strict guidelines and transferring male embryos only. The FDA had to approve this because this is genetic modification. The FDA agreed with the recommendations, but then a congressional writer to the funding legislation for the FDA said that the agency couldn't use federal funds to implement the recommendations. So you cannot use these techniques in the United States. It is allowed in some other countries. And one of them is Britain, which strictly controls their use. So for years, assisted reproductive technologies have raised moral and ethical issues. Three parent embryos, uterus transplants, pregnancy in your 60s. Unlike nearly every other developed country in the world, the United States does not have federal regulation of assisted reproduction. So for this reason, the United States is often called the Wild West of reproductive medicine. In this country, if they choose to do so, fertility centers can purchase donor sperm and donor eggs and create ready-made embryos. One for fertility center is actually already doing it. People can purchase these ready-made embryos just as they can purchase eggs and sperm. If you want to, you can pay someone else whatever the market will bear to have your baby. And since this is a commercial transaction, you can also abandon that baby before or after birth. If you are a woman in your late 50s, as long as you can get a doctor to agree to treat you, you can try to have a baby, no matter what the potential risk to your health. And as a nation, we make it possible for the well-off to have babies using whatever technologies are available. 
but those without sufficient means may find it impossible to afford treatment with any of the assisted reproductive technologies. Only eight states mandate more or less comprehensive insurance coverage for IVF. New Jersey is one of them. In the rest of the United States, you are out of luck if you don't have the money. And one cycle of basic IVF without any add-ons can cost between 15,000 and 19,000. And not everybody gets pregnant on your first try. <sighs> the use of these technologies will surely continue to expand in the coming years. Marriage equality has eliminated legal hurdles for gay and lesbian couples choosing to bear children. Single women without partners are choosing parenthood. And many women with male partners are waiting longer to have children because it's simply not possible in the United States for many women who want children to have them during their most fertile years. They too have new options. The characteristics of family have changed over the decades, but the quest for a family remains as salient as it was in the early days of IVF. Unfortunately, in the United States, access to new technologies depends on who you are and how much money you have. There is a class and racial divide that has barely budged in the last two decades. I want to end this talk with two important statements that Wanda and I leave readers with at the end of our book. First, we make the case that healthcare is a human right and that fertility care is an integral part of healthcare. Everybody, we believe, should have reasonable access to fertility treatment. Access to assisted reproduction should not be limited to those who can pay for it. And second, and this is even more complicated, we offer a range of suggestions to move the United States to develop national policies on assisted reproduction. This is an even more difficult task. In fact, one medical ethicist that we really admire, Art Kaplan, told us flat out, the the regulation train has left the station, but we hope not. We think this is an equally important thing to do. So finally, thank you so much for being here today. And I'm now happy to take your questions. Over to you, Julie. <laughs> thank you so much for that fascinating talk, Dr. Marsh. So as Dr. Marsh mentioned, she's graciously agreed to participate in a question and answer session today. Um, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A feature and I will pose the question to Dr. Marsh. And Dr. Marsh will answer as many questions as time allows. So we do have a question, um, Dr. Marsh. So the first one up is, how did you become interested in the topic of the history of medicine, um, particularly reproductive health? Well, so this is an actual very funny story. Uh, my, my sister came home from doing her residency in obstetrics and gynecology. She was in, she was in Rochester. She had been in Boston and Rochester for four years. And she came back to Philly and she, she joined a practice. And she said, wouldn't it be great for us to do a topic in the history of obstetrics and gynecology. And, um, and I said, oh, you know, yeah. I mean, I was a historian of women. She was an expert in women's health. I thought this would be great. And, uh, but I didn't know what to do. I didn't know anything about the history of obstetrics and gynecology. And I ran into a colleague who I didn't know very well at the time, but got to know very well later. Her name is Janet Golden. If any of you know her, she was a faculty member here. And I told her all about this. And she said, well, do the history of infertility. Nobody's done this. So, so I said this to my sister and and it sounded like a wonderful idea. And so we did our first book on, on, on this subject called The Empty Cradle. Um, we got grants to do it. We had a wonderful, amazing time. 
um, the book got to be I named an outstanding academic book, and we were just really excited about this. And and one of the one of the people we had um, we had profiled in the book, who was the most prominent um, infertility specialist in the country in the middle of the 20th century. Um, I had to ask his daughter for permission to quote from his papers. And, and so when I, which were kind of uncatalogued in, in, at Harvard, and when I did, she said, you know, I, I have about a hundred boxes of my father's papers here in my attic in addition. And so the next thing you know, we were writing a, a cultural biography of, of John Rock, who was the most famous infertility specialist in the 1940s and 50s, and then the co-developer of the oral contraceptive. And so then we did that. And then the next thing you knew, everybody was asking us questions about the contemporary scene. And we said, well, okay. Uh, so the family has a joke um, that, uh, uh, the, our last book was the final volume in our infertility trilogy. So it's not, you know, so, so it was, it was an accident. I mean, we, we were all excited to be interviewed by Malcolm Gladwell and he said and for, for his, one of his podcasts and it was really exciting. And he said, so essentially you decided to do this because you wanted to spend more time together. <laughs> And that's not really true. I mean, we have really complementary strengths, but but it is partly true. <laughs> and but we've had, you know, I mean, we've really learned so much, and we have we have um, we have loved doing these books, and we have met so many interesting people from women who use these technologies in the 1980s, and we've learned about their experiences uh, to some of the unknown men and women who were. Um, pioneers in the use of, of these technologies in, in the 19, in developing these technologies in the 1980s. It's been great. That's wonderful. Now, um, you mentioned, you know, the different projects you've worked on. So what's up next? What are, what's your next adventure? My, my, ne my next project has, has nothing to do with this. I've gotten very interested in, in the changing nature of of women's health in the 1970s and 1980s. And I've got particularly interested, uh, although this does have a little something to do with my sister, particularly interested in the huge increase in the number of women physicians, especially women in obstetrics and gynecology in the 1970s and the 1980s. Uh, and, until the 1970s and 80s, obstetrics and gynecology was an almost totally male field because it was a surgical field and male doctors dominated in surgery. And then with the feminist movement and other kinds of things, women became women were going into medicine and women were going into obstetrics and gynecology. So I'm interested to understand the impact of both the women's health movement and the growing number of women in the field of women, women physicians in the field of women's health and what impact they've had on not just women's health, but the practice of medicine. So I'm just getting started on this. So I don't exactly know what I'm doing, uh, but I'm trying to figure it. This, this is my year to figure it out. Thank you. So, Going back to the topic at hand, so what do you think is the single most groundbreaking scientific breakthrough in terms of reproductive health and why? In terms of overall reproductive health, mm, in terms of overall reproductive health, I would have to say the oral contraceptive because you know that is so that has had such an impact on women's ability to control their fertility. Uh, so the reproductive health overall, I would say that. In terms, of, in terms of assisted reproduction, it would have to be the initial breakthrough of IVF because once you could do that, there were ways in which you could treat infertility 
um, enable people who want to have genetic parenthood, and many people do want to have genetic parenthood, to be able to achieve genetic parenthood. So that, you know, so that was the, that was the technology that started it all. And in this talk, I, I really spoke about IVF as being created to kind of bypass uh, defective fallopian tubes or non-existent ones. And that really was the reason, but Robert Edwards was himself a geneticist. And so early on in his work, there was always the idea in the back of his mind that IVF might be able to stop some children from having to suffer from very devastating genetic diseases like cystic fibrosis, or for example, one of the most devastating mitochondrial uh, diseases is something called Lay syndrome or Lee syndrome. I've never figured out exactly how to pronounce it. It's L-E-I-G-H. And it's a terrible neurological disorder that begins in infancy and it causes lots of problems for children. And mitochondrial replacement techniques can, can replace a woman that's passed on with a, through a woman's mitochondria, um, can make it possible to have a child that doesn't have that. And it's, uh, so there, so, so even early on, Robert Edwards was thinking about, um, about these kinds of issues, but it wasn't really possible to develop any of the techniques until the 1990s when uh, PGD was developed. Currently, what is the rate of success for IVF? So, so you know, I said, I was telling you that the take home baby rate uh, nationally in the 1980s when they started was about 9%. Now that was nationally, some places were doing a lot better than that. Um, and, and now it's like more than 9% for women between 40 and 45. So the success rates depend on your age, the age of the, well, the age of the eggs. So if you use donor eggs, it depends on the age of the donor. If you're using your own eggs, it depends on your age. And, and it drives historians nuts because this, uh, this information is, is, is tracked by the CDC. Um, and, and so, but they always change, every year they seem to change how they track it. So right now they track success rates from the time you successfully get an egg. So this means you might've had people who you know, go through the process and they don't get an egg. But if you get an egg and you're in your 20s, your chances are like 55%. By the time in your in your early in your early 30s, it's about 40%. In your later 30s, um, it's about um, I want to say I could actually turn around and look it up. I want to say around 26 or 27%. 40 to 45, about nine and a half percent, and over 45, like 45 to 50, one percent. That's using your own eggs. Now, if you use donor eggs, your success is really by the age of the donor uh, because it's, that's, that's the age of the egg. Okay. Um, what do you identify as the most glaring issue of sexism or misogyny in the field today? Oh, gee, I don't even think I know how to answer that. I don't think I know how to answer that question. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I mean, yeah, I don't. I don't know quite. They're, they're, it's, it's taking me out of my reproductive medicine uh, sphere right this minute. No worries. Um, so the last question, I think, before we go back to Mary Claire Venuto for closing remarks. So the last question is, what developments in reproductive health do we anticipate next? What's the future hold? Well, so, so this is really interesting. And I'm going to try to answer this quickly, but it's a little hard. So Howard Jones, you saw Howard Jones um, early on. 
he retired at the age of 100 um, and died, um, died a couple of, a few years ago at the age of 104, I think. And right before he retired, he gave this speech about what he thought should be the research um, in assisted reproduction. And one of them, you know, one of those re research areas was on, on, on uterus transplants and, and another area, and I was on um, things like mitochondrial replacement technology. So I, I think that in the future, we're gonna be looking more at um, preventing disease if, if we can. And the other thing that I think we've, we've done a good job at so far, uh, that is the profession has done a good job, is reducing multiple births and all of the health issues that come around with multiple births. And I think there's gonna be a lot more refinements in, in that area so that um, people will be able to, to not to have the stress on their systems of having a multiple birth and be able to have uh, a, sing a single birth by just transferring one embryo. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Marsh, for both the talk and answering questions. Um, we've all really enjoyed learning from you today. Um, and so now I'm going to turn it over to Mary Claire Venuto for closing remarks. Hey, Julie. My name is Mary Claire Venuto, and I'm the Associate Director of Alumni Engagement for Rutgers Camden. On behalf of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences Camden and the Rutgers University Alumni Association, I wanna thank Dr. Marsh for sharing her research and expertise on the history of assisted reproductive technology. I also personally wanna thank her for her unwavering support of our beloved Camden campus. Many thanks to our attendees for your engagement today and for all the ways you support our university. Please watch your email for future Scarlet Scholars lectures and visit ouralumni.com for upcoming programming. Take care and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. <laughs>